All right. Welcome to another edition of the Attorney Lounge. Uh, I have a good friend of mine on the show today, Ben Herbert. Uh, thanks for joining us. No problem. Happy to be here, Brian. Looking forward to it. Uh, ben is a partner with Miller Barandas. Did I say it correctly? <laughs> no, it's Miller Barandas. Barandas. Golly, we tried that right before we, uh, and I still screwed it up. The Miller part, uh, we were certain that I would get. Figures I would screw up the other part. But Ben is a trial uh, attorney that specializes in intellectual property. And uh, Miller uh, Barandess, did I do it that right that time? You got it right that time. Is one of the uh, leading law firms in, in trial uh, matters, right? And you have been hired to start an IP litigation practice group within that firm. Is that uh, is that right? Did I get that right? I sound like a it. deposition. It sounds like yeah. I'm doing this in a deposition. I just just say, tell us about what you do uh, at, at your firm. So I'll say it that way. Well, now I'm living out my dream of being a deponent in a deposition, but <laughs> that's mostly right. Okay. Um, so Miller Berendis is a roughly 40 attorney general litigation trial boutique. And, you know, historically they have done everything other than hard IP. So patents and, you know, I consider part of IP to be technical trade secrets, and we can probably dive into a little bit about what that means. But that's sort of an area of law that they haven't really done. They do everything other than that. So, you know, big breach of contract cases. Um, Skip, one of the main partners, does white collar crime. We have other people that do that too. And and then there's also securities litigation. Basically, the firm prides itself on being trial lawyers and going to trial. And sort of outside of the hard IP, they do everything. Um, and they asked me, oh, 11 months ago now to come over and build out a hard IP patent practice for them because they were getting clients that were asking and they were interested in doing it. And it was a pretty unique opportunity and I jumped at the chance. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And and, and a long history uh, in LA, right? Yeah, so Skip has been litigating in Los Angeles for 50 years. Uh, if you talk to anybody that's been a general litigator for any period of time in Los Angeles, they are well aware of who Skip Miller is because yeah. based on his you know, trial expertise. Let's start from kind of the beginning. Talk about a little bit about yourself, just where you grew up, uh, kind of where you went to college, law school, kind of how you got interested in law in the first place. Sure. So I grew up in Re in Rochester, New York, um, which, you know, I think people that are from that area refer to it as Western New York. Uh, I'm trying to get into the vernacular adopted the New York panhandle. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, that one before that. I feel like if you're going to let Texas have a panhandle, then the New York panhandle should count as well. But, you know, I, I understand, it, it, you know, some people are sort of purists and they kind of think, well, it's Oklahoma and maybe Florida have panhandles because uh, there's sort of a width issue. But if you're going to say Texas has a panhandle, I think New York gets one, too. Yeah. Um, So I, I grew up there in a small town south of Rochester. You know, I think my town still to this day has one stoplight, and I grew up across the street from a cow pasture. Um, so nice. <laughs> a little different in L.A., I would think. Yeah. A, a little bit different than L.A. Um, and as soon as I was, it was possible for me to get out of Rochester, I left as quickly as humanly possible. And I went to undergrad at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and my undergrad degree is in molecular bio. Um, and, and I'm one of these, I think, pretty strange people that for some reason in high school, I had this sense that I wanted to be a biotechnology patent lawyer, which mm, I, I, I don't, I don't yeah. know exactly how I knew that was a thing back in, you know, 1997, 1998. Um, but that's what I wanted to do. And so the plan was always to go to undergrad for biology and then go to law school. Um, and so that that's with, with a slight detour in DC working in pan, campaign politics in between graduating from undergrad and then going to law school. That's sort of the path that I was on. That's interesting. So, I mean, did you, did you like science growing up? Like merging those two things together is, you know, pretty unique. Like what, what, what yeah. 
do you have any recollection of what kind of made you interested in that particular path back then, all the way back then? I don't know. So, yeah. So I was always, I, I always liked biology and I was always pretty proficient at it. So, and in terms, but I, you know, there were some family, me not direct family members, but sort of, you know, cousins and stuff like that that were lawyers in my family. Um, my sort of immediate family were sort of architects and doctors and stuff like that. So n no, no lawyers in my immediate family. Um, and I think that, you know, sort of that period of time until like 95 and 2000 was sort of when all the genome sequencing and stuff like that was in the news. Yeah. And I think that that probably had part to do with it, but I, I don't really remember how I even learned, like knew that there was a thing called, you know, biotech patent law, but. Right. Yeah. Uh, especially as a high school kid to, to be thinking yeah. about, about that kind of stuff is pretty unique. Um, and so from Rochester, I guess, how'd you end up in Colorado? Were you looking at other colleges? Is it just, did you, you know, what led you there? So my family had been, it had had a, had a place out in Big Sky, I think starting in like 1984. And so we spent an awful lot of time, you know, two weeks every winter, two weeks every summer out there, probably from, you know, the point in time I was like four or five, so like 86, 87, mm -hmm. um, until, I don't know, the mid nineties or something like that. We spent basically a month out there. And so... I liked it out west generally better than anyways. Yep. Um, and I, I started snowboarding in 1989 when I was seven. And so it was very much into that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I don't know that I think people that are involved in science and, and sort of engineering know that the University of Colorado is very strong in the hard sciences and, and engineering. Mm -hmm. um, I think that people that aren't in those fields sort of think it's a party school and it has Deion Sanders as the football coach. Right. Um, but it actually is a very good for hard sciences. And so that and my brother was out at Colorado College down in Colorado Springs. So even though we were moving a long way away, um, there was at least a little bit of a connection to somebody. I mean, it's like two hours away yep. from Boulder. So there's a little bit of connection. I could snowboard. I could go to a really good molecular bio program. And I mean, to be honest, I mean, the campus is beautiful. So it's not a, yeah. it's not a bad place to spend four years of your life. Yeah, Colorado's awesome. There's a lot of a lot of kids from Phoenix that end up going to Colorado. Boulder's beautiful. It's got, you know, kind of a thriving um, startup culture there. It's a really cool um, town. So um, very attractive place to, to, to go to school. Okay, so then uh, during your time at Colorado, um, a lot of students will listen um, to the show. And so they're kind of interested in at what point do you start preparing for the LSAT, looking at different schools, just a little bit in terms of your path of when you started getting ready to, to look at different schools, prepare for the LSAT and that process of getting into law school, what was that like for you? So I think I started looking at potentially doing it in, I don't know, like junior year or something like that. And and I, and I took a test prep course and, you know, I was doing much better on the practice tests than I was doing on the actual test. And I sort of started getting more, I think it was as I was approaching my senior year, I was just sort of looking at what I was doing and realizing that I didn't want to go straight through. And I, I had an opportunity to jump onto the Kerry, the John Kerry presidential campaign for the 04 cycle. And so that's basically what I did. Um, and it was supposed to sort of be like a year off to sort of do something different yeah. before I went back to school. You know, it, it ended up being three years I spent in D.C. working on um, Democratic campaign politics, first on the CARE campaign, and, and obviously uh, that ended very poorly in November. And oh. November of 2004, that ended very poorly. Yeah. Um, we were actually, I was in Boston for that whole ordeal. That was that was a pretty brutal night. Um, and but then, it, it actually started out somewhat successfully, didn't it? Because he was sort of down and out at the beginning of the campaign. And then he, the Iowa, if I remember right, in Iowa, he sort of 
took yeah, he he was he he was a ascendant in Iowa, and then even that even that that day, the exit polling on election day was was not accurate, and so the exit polling had him probably winning, and then you know over the course of that day, real vote numbers started coming in, and it became came clear that the exit polling was off dramatically. And by that evening, Eastern, it was pretty clear that he was going to lose. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't turn out well, but after the campaign's over, you stayed in D.C. to continue. What, what were you doing at that point? Yeah, so uh, I, you know, the number of available jobs for, for people that were Democrats looking to do campaign stuff um, or, or even stuff on the Hill, shrank dramatically in that 04 cycle because it was, you know, there were some massive losses in the House and the Senate as well as the presidential. Um, and some people that I knew from the Kerry campaign ended up going over to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the DCCC. And, you know, for people that might not know, they're, sens they're essentially the official arm of the Democratic Party that runs all the House races or sort of manages all the House races and sort of helps sort of coordinate with all the different candidates that are running for the House. And that's and so I knew some people that were there and I sort of worked out a thing with them, with the press people that I would come on and basically do like an externship for, I don't know what we agreed to, like three months or something. And if it worked out, they would bring me on and hire me full time. And that cycle, Rahm Emanuel was the chair of the DCCC. So I ended up working for him at the DTRIP for pretty much almost two years um, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an incredible experience, I'll say that. Yeah. And at, at that point then, I assume you're still thinking about law school, how did you transition kind of from that and, uh, you know, starting the process for applying for law schools? Yeah. So that cycle, the 06 cycle ended up, you know, there was no presidential that year because it's an off year, but it ended up dramatically differently than the 04 cycle. You know, the how that cycle, the Democrats ended up winning 30 seats in the House and taking back the majority. And they also won back the Senate majority. I'm almost positive. Um, and. At some point when we were getting close to election day, or it must have been before that, because I, I, I retook the LSAT. Mm -hmm. And I think at a certain point I realized it's been, you know, two, almost three years. If I don't go back to school now, I'm going to probably never do it. Mm -hmm. And it was always sort of this was supposed to be a transition and take a little bit of time off before going back, you know, so I better just go and do it. And if I go to law school and I hate it, I can always come back to D.C. and and work in campaign politics again because, you know, it, well over half of the people that work in D.C. on campaigns have have, J, have law degrees. So, you know, I always figured it's not it's not like if I go and hate it, I can always come back and do this and I'll be sort of no worse for the wear. And if I go and I like it, you know, I'll, I'll do the law. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And, and so that was sort of the impetus behind doing it was it, sort of staying true to what the path, the pathway had been initially. And it was this was a break and I was going to go to law school. And I and I knew I was getting very close to the time period where if I didn't go back, I was never going to go. back. Yep. And so ASU, you're in D.C., how do you end up, I mean, at this point, you have no connection to Phoenix, right? I mean, so how do you end up at ASU Law? Um, I had no connection to Phoenix. I had never been to Phoenix before. I think I interviewed or I, I, I went to the school to just visit, basically. That was the first time I'd ever been there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they at that point in time, they still do to this day. They have a very good intellectual property program at ASU. Um, and they have a lot more coursework than a lot of others, than a lot of other university law schools that are even known for it. Um, I think ASU still has, you know, more classes on those subjects. And so that was still something I was very much interested in. Um, I, I again, don't take the LSAT very well. So I really took it, you know, I was scoring like 10 points lower than I would do on the practice exams. And, and the company I, 
I did the practice exams with, it wasn't sort of like this take home thing at all. Is you go to a, a conference room in a hotel and you sit down with a bunch of people in a big room and you do it like you're really doing an LSAT. So, but for whatever reason, you know, whenever in the practice, I, I, you know, mentally I still must have realized it was practice. And then at the real thing, you know, I just never did as well. Um, so ASU ended up, I think, being the best school I got into. And back in the day, uh, I went there 07 to 2010. So, or 2010, sorry. And so back in the day, they were like, I think, 50th in the country or something like that. Um, and so it was the best school that I got into. I, I barely, I, I barely got into it. <laughs> hey, I barely got into KU, you know? And so uh, I don't know what our ranking was, but yeah, no, I'm familiar with that. So, uh, yeah, I, I hear you. But it's about what you do after that. And obviously you did well. Uh, because you ended up with a clerkship, um, federal district court, which is not easy to get. Um, so I guess, what was your experience like at ASU and what was that transition like into the federal clerkship? Yeah. So I ended up doing very well at ASU. So there was always the possibility of potentially getting a clerkship. Um, and it was something that I was interested in doing. And there was a new dean at the school, I think came on my second my second year, um, Dean Paul Berman, who's no longer there. But he was very interested in trying to expand the profile of the school. Mm -hmm. And as part of doing that, he wanted to get people getting more clerkships, especially more clerkships outside of the state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. So the school was really supportive of me applying to clerkships all over and they even foot the bill to have me fly to go fly to go do interviews and stay at a hotel do interview and come back hmm. um so i summered my second year of law school at kirkland and ellis out in los angeles and i met a couple of partners there who had relationships with judge o'malley who at that point in time was on the Northern District of Ohio Federal District Court up in Cleveland. And there was scuttlebutt around that point in time that she was on a short list to get nominated for the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, which, you know, for your listeners that are not patent dorks like you and I kind of are, it, you know, that's basically the court that all appeals about patents go to and sort of they're the final say on probably 99 percent of patent appeals the Supreme Court doesn't take. And so you know, for all intents and purposes, the federal circuit's basically the, you know, the Supreme Court for patents in the country. Yep. Um, and so that was really interesting because I want I at that point, I still want to do patent law. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up getting an interview my letter of recommendation i had a letter of recommendation from rob man like a, a letter of recommendation from rob emanuel who at that point was he had left congress and was the white house chief of staff for obama it's pretty good uh, that's a pretty good reference i would say you know it was <laughs> and i'll never forget i went i went and met with judge o'malley and we had a good interview and then I flew home that night and the next morning I was in Phoenix. I get this call from, you know, a Cleveland area code at 630 in the morning, um, Phoenix time. I'm like, what is this? And I call and it was one of the judge's current clerks that I had met with. And he said, well, the, the judge likes to check all the, the letters of recommendation personally. And I've been trying to call the White House switchboard to get in touch with Ron Emanuel and that hasn't been working out for me. I'm thinking to myself, Shocking yeah. that, you know, trying to call the White House switchboard to talk to Ron Manuel is not working for you. A little tough. For, yeah. yeah. Hey, is Rom there? Can I, you know, uh, got a quick question for him. Yeah. So uh, I I basically said, okay, let me try and see what I can do. And I and I called a bunch of people that I worked with, the DCCC, became Obama campaign people, and then became, what he won, o Obama White House staffers. And so I called a couple of them that that I still knew. And ended up piecing it together. And he ended up talking with, that was a Friday. And he ended up talking with Judge O'Malley Saturday morning for me. Mm -hmm. um, which, you no, know, listen, I, I think people, when they hear the name Rob Emanuel, all sorts of things jump into their mind. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that's the guy that's the brother of the Ari Gold character in Entourage. True. Uh, yep. <laughs> um, yep. 
Um, and, you know, he has a certain reputation. But I think if you talk to people that worked with him for any extended period of time, there's a tremendous amount of loyalty that those people have for him. And it's because once you show him that you're willing to crawl through glass for him, he'll crawl through just as much glass for you as you'll claw, crawl through for him. Yep. So, yep. I mean, it's pretty remarkable that someone that you worked I worked for him for probably almost three years, something like that, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that someone like that, when he's White House Chief of Staff, will get on the phone and, and talk to a federal judge about potentially you going clerking for us says a lot about a person. Yeah, that's awesome. And it obviously... He, he obviously said some nice things about you because it worked out. He didn't kill your chances. And it's, and it's a, it's a testament to the, um, you know, the power of, um, internships and just, you know, building your connections early in your career, um, as you're sort of working your way up, um, you know, that came back obviously and was extremely helpful. Um, so you ended up at the federal circuit. Yep. So I moved to, so I, I ended up getting the job um, and sort of an express, in a sort of a, in a, an express stipulation of it was, you know, I might get nominated. If I get nominated, are you going to be willing to move to D.C.? Um, and I was. So I ended up living in Cleveland for six or seven months, clerking for her on the Northern District of Ohio. And then she got confirmed, I think, in November or December or something like that. And we ended up um, moving to D.C. in, like, January, I think, something like that. Um, so that would have been, like, January of 2011, I think, something like that. And so I ended up doing six months at district court and 18 months at the federal circuit um, for Judge O'Malley's sort of first year and a half um, on the court. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, what an amazing experience. I mean, it's, you know, clerking out of law school is reserved for some of the most prolific students. I was not, those, those opportunities were not available to a student like me. Um, but, uh, an amazing experience that I'm sure you saw some amazing, um, things in your time, you know, working on at, at that court. Yeah. Immensely. I think if what you want to be doing in your career is litigating, I think there's nothing better that you can do. And and I'd say specifically if what you really want to be doing is litigating, it, it, you should really be aiming to try and do a district court clerkship. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's so much about discovery and how things work in a trial court that you just don't learn in law school. And and I think, listen, I'm not bashing on law school. I think a lot of it you can't really teach. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's a great way to get those skills before you jump into a big firm. Um, and, you know, I think most people that do clerkships um, will come in sort of ahead of their peers on, on those aspects of, of the practice of law, which is always a good thing. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, I think a lot of district court clerk judges now are requiring two-year clerkships um, because a lot of them sort of think... In, there's so much that you need to know to do that clerkship that a lot of them feel like if you're only a year, they sort of get you trained at a year and then you leave. And then you're going. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of them want two years. And to be perfectly honest, a lot of them now are showing a, a um, preference for people that have worked in a big law, in a law firm for a number of years and then come and take a break and then go back. Oh, so, so what I would say is, you know, I think there are opportunities for people you know, that aren't necessarily the top 10% of their class, if they still end up going to a solid law firm and do really well there and, and, and want to do it while they're at that firm, they should be trying to network with people that did clerkships. Um, and it's not a closed door. And I think especially for district court, there's tons of people that, you know, work in a big firm for two or three years, clerk for two years and then come back. And so after your clerkship, then you go to work at Kirkland. Is that correct? One of the best law firms, one of the biggest law firms in the world. Um, so you go from one major opportunity clerking in the federal circuit to now moving to LA with Kirkland. So what, what was that like? You know, I think that people have, Kirkland obviously has a reputation. You know, the LA office, when I came to it in 2012, was still around 100 attorneys. It was probably 
a third general litigation, a third IP litigation, and like a third corporate. And so it was still small enough that you basically knew every all the attorneys at the firm, you kind of knew. Even if they were corporate attorneys, you still knew them because it was small enough. And I really thought I loved it there. You know, the reason I went there is because I liked, I really enjoyed the people I met when I was summering. And, you know, I always try and tell people that are in that position of, you know, two hours trying to figure out where they want to summer. You know, the biggest thing to try and figure out is the fit for, you know, you and the firm and the firm and you. And and sort of, I think both parties in that whole summer hiring um, situation, like the law firm is trying to figure out fit, just like you should be trying to figure out fit. You know, I, I always sort of adopt or modify the start quote, you know, he says, how is other people? And I sort of add the addendum onto it, especially when you're working 80 to hundred hours a week with them. Um, and you, and he, yeah. you know, and so you want to make sure you join the people that you like. Yeah. And I really liked the people at Kirkland, you know, specifically in the IP group, but more broadly in, in the entire office. And, you know, I'm still, even though I'm no longer there, I'm still very good friends with them. I I litigated there for 11 years. Mm -hmm. Yep. Doing, doing, started out doing patent stuff. Um, I was sort of one of the few people that always at Kirkland did, you know, sort of an even split of defense side work and plaintiff side work. And I think the plaintiff side work is pretty rare at a place like Kirkland. It used to be back then pretty rare at a place like Kirkland. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, about halfway through the career, I started doing a, a fair number of plaintiff side trade secret stuff. Um, misappropriation matters too. So yep. um, that's sort of what my practice is these days is both plaintiffs and defense side patent work. Um, across all technologies, Kirkland is a place that you know is tech agnostic, and so they don't sort of have oh this person's got a double E background, so they only work on double E patents. Kirkland's essentially like oh you're a patent litigator, um, which they don't even require a technical background to do that. You just have to sort of not be afraid to teach yourself technology, and so uh, you know, I the closest I've ever gotten to molecular bio patent. <laughs> is is you know uh the plastic used in artificial hip and knee joints and spinal fusion implants which i which, what you're thinking is that's not within a country mile of molecular bio and you would be right and, and and you know i've gone to the other end of the spectrum you know microprocessors thermal thermal sensors on microprocessors and you know all the source code for digital mobile radio so and everything in between um it's interesting to me too. I mean, you're working on one of the biggest firms in the world. Uh, you're working on probably some of the biggest cases. How long, you know, like what what's your practice like in your first few years? Like how long does it take before you're, you know, actually like in the courtroom, you're sort of first chairing things, you're getting, you know, trial experience, that kind of stuff. Did that happen quickly for you or did it take some time to build up to that? So, I, so what I did, at, so I came in, I took two year clerkship. I took one year of credit for, so I came in as a second year. Clerk. There was, there was an opportunity I could have gotten two years of credit, but I sort of, I thought it was, I still wasn't, I still wasn't old at that point in time. And I thought it was better off taking one year of credit and I'd probably be a little bit further ahead mm -hmm. than taking two years and maybe being a little bit further behind. Um, so I came in as a second year. I was taking depositions, you know, in the first three months, I think. And and I actually, and, and I took the first deposition I ever attended, I took. Uh, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> which I'll never forget. I was walking in with, with the, you know, the, not, the junior partner who was supervising and we were walking in. And she she looked at me and she said, "Is this the first deposition you've ever been to?" And I said, "Yep." And she was like, "We'll see how this goes." And so I, I think Kirkland, it, it does. It is true that it, it tends to staff cases really leanly, and you get a lot of experience. Um, I was sort of thinking about. You know, I was suspecting you might ask me, well, you know, what are what are a couple of cases that you really remember? And I've been thinking about that the last couple of days. And one of them was a you know an offensive plaintiff side patent case that I worked on. I think pretty much from day one when I came in at Kirkland. Um, it's certainly in the first year, and it was for the LA Orthopedic 
Hospital, which is a not-for-profit children's hospital in LA that, you know, part of the way that they generate funds to to basically perform orthopedic sur- surgeries for children they can't afford it is through licensing revenue. So we had this lawsuit with with the Pew about the plastic that's in the in artificial hip and knee joints, essentially. And I was a fifth year at Kirkland and we were arguing, we were just, we, the other side, Depew had filed motions for summary judgment and the lead counsel at Jones Day got up and it was in, it was in district court in Indiana, Northern District of Indiana in Fort Wayne, if I remember correctly, and got up and, and, you know, was sort of saying some st- saying a bunch of stuff and, and the lead partner looked at me and sort of said, is, is any of that true? And I said, no, and I can explain it. And the partner looked at me and, and said, well, you better be able to, cause you're doing it. Um, <laughs> maybe in some slightly more colorful language. Yeah. Um, and so I stood up as a fifth year associate and argued the basically the reply argument in front of the magistrate judge on this summary judgment hearing and in front of at that point depew was part of johnson and johnson and there was actually a johnson and johnson in-house counsel that was in the gallery and and i thought that i did a very good job the the partners thought that i did a very good job and you know i think three months later the opinion comes out and sort of a, a bunch of the the math and the argument that I had been making made its way into the order and the judge actually did some math based off of what I was doing that I didn't actually do in front of him. And, and so that was an incredibly gratifying point in time. And so that was at a fifth year. I was, you know, I was co-first chairing a, you know, summary judgment argument. Yeah. I think there's some, sometimes people think, you know, that, you know, you don't get as much experience if you're at a bigger firm and you're going to have to be, you know, you'll be stuck in an office doing, you know, research and writing and you're not getting practical experience. And um, I think it just kind of varies on the firm and the type of practice you're in. And I think it's kind of all over the board and doing your research, like you said, to find out whether it's a good fit for you, I think is, is what's most important. Cause I, I think that that assumption is, is not always accurate. Um, I think that's right. I, I, I'll say you have to work at it. I mean, it's not something like you're just going to go into a big firm and you're going to be getting tons of opportunities as like a first or second year. That That's not going to happen. You need to you need to really work at it and make sure that you're getting put on cases where those opportunities are going to arise, you know. And if you're on, you know, if you're on some massive case with 30 attorneys for a Fortune 50 company, the likelihood of you getting early experience is probably very low. And yeah. so, you know, you need to be strategic. I think you need to be strategic about the types of cases that you're working on. Um, or, you know, you go to a, a some boutique place like Miller Berendis where, you know, we staff really lean and, you know, junior associates are expected to be doing, you know, substantive stuff, taking depositions, standing up and doing arguments and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It, it's two different approaches. You know, I think you can get the great experience in both places. I just think if you're in big law, you you have to, you know, take ownership over your career and and, and be focused on that much more so if you're at somewhere that's smaller. Yeah, yeah. Did you um, like in terms of, I've asked this on a couple of different the podcasts. I mean, would you recommend big law coming out of law school as sort of your first job? Um, yeah, or do you think that like um, it's just different for every, everybody in terms of their path. I mean, one of the, one of the people that I interviewed, you know, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Al Shakravarti, he worked, he started at a big firm and then he took a step back and went and became a prosecutor for a few years. Then he worked in the department of justice. He got a ton of trial experience and now he's a partner at Snell and Wilmer. And, you know, he kind of took, you know, one step back in order to take two steps forward. Um, but, you know, other people I talk to is kind of like, you know, there's nothing like the experience you get working at a big law firm um, and and sort of having that first experience and the exposure you get to different clients and different partners. So I guess and your, from your perspective, I guess, how would you if if a, a, a second or third year student came and said, I have an opportunity to go to a boutique litigation firm or to go to a big law firm, what what would you tell them? 
A quick break here to thank our sponsor, Array, for making this podcast possible. The bottom line is, if you're involved in a lawsuit, please reach out. Array handles the logistics for any litigation matter. They take care of forensic collection, e-discovery, managed review, record retrieval, court reporting. They even take care of legal staffing and recruiting, you name it. I'm a little biased because I'm the chief legal officer at Array, but I was also an Array client before I started working there, and they became my first call whenever I had to manage a litigation matter. Array handles all of the details of your lawsuit so you can focus on winning your case. Feel free to reach out to me directly or visit trustarray.com and we'll get you set up. Now, back to the pod. Well, classic lawyer answer, it depends. <laughs> I think that's the right answer, right? But yeah. Hey, listen, I think what it depends on is it depends on what you ultimately want to do. If you want to be an equity partner at some AM50 law firm, I think right now in in this moment and probably for the last, you know, five, six years, the number of people that are making equity at firms like that that are homegrown is nowhere near what it used to be. And and I and I and I think most people that are equity at those places are laterals that have come in from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, like your friend that you just mentioned. And so I think of what your goal is, oh, I want to be equity partner at some AM fifth top fifty firm. I think there's I think you need to seriously consider going someplace that's good but smaller and getting a you know, getting a ton of experience, trying a ton of cases. Because, you know, the group that I worked with at Kirkland tried a lot of cases. You know, we probably tried you know, the team that I worked as part of. You know, the, the team overall probably tried at least two or three cases a year, but that's really unusual for big law. And, you know, that skill set of being a trial lawyer, you really only get from trying cases and it's incredibly valuable. And so if you go to someplace smaller and you get a ton of trial experience and it's also a lot easier to do client development and maybe get a little bit of a portable book, I think that's probably an easier path to getting equity at somewhere like that now in litigation than if than the homegrown route. Yeah. And so I, I think it, if the answer is, well, I just want to go there, I don't have any, I, I don't really want to be an equity partner. You know, I, I want to go and I'm fine sort of being of counsel for, for my career at the top, like topping out of counsel or sort of whatever they call their non-equity tier. And that's fine with me. I think all things being equal, probably going to someplace some big law place is fine because you're you'll at the end of the day you'll probably get compensated more over the course of your career by doing that um if you don't want to get equity but you know just from sort of looking around at the market right now and having a lot of friends that are in the market and sort of seeing what's going on you know i think it's slightly i think the chances are better of you getting equity at a place you know a top 50 am firm from lateraling in with having been somewhere smaller and having a ton of experience yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and kind of the evolving sort of landscape of the big, big law sort of culture. And, you know, a lot of people like back, you know, you know, back in the day, right. A lot of people, they'd go work at like IBM right out of college and they'd spend 30 or 40 years and never leave. And there's a lot more movement. Um, well, I'm going to transition too, cause we, you know, we've been, uh, talking for a bit here and I really want to get to this because an, an incredibly unique experience that you had in terms of litigation financing. So I, I tell, I guess just, you know, tell our listeners kind of what that is, what, what is litigation financing and what was your experience like there? And just kind of like, you know, in a, in a very simplistic way, kind of explain how that works and, and, um, kind of the, you know, the development of that kind of industry uh, in, the, in the legal field. Sure. So I worked at Kirkland from what, roughly August, September 2012 until the end of December 2020. And um, then I transitioned and I, I went to go work at the Law Finance Group. And they're based out of just outside of San Francisco and Mill Valley. Um, and they're technically the oldest litigation funder that's based in the United States. But traditionally, they've done litigation funding 
on, on appeal. So only after you have a judgment. Um, and so they're not sort of in what people think of as the traditional lit funding world. They're not as well known as some of the other big players, although that's starting to change. And so I guess what's litigation funding? So I think everyone's sort of familiar with contingency fee plaintiff cases and kind of has a sense of what that is. And that's, you know, plaintiff comes to a law firm, says, I got this great case, but I can't pay for it. And the law firm essentially says, okay, got it. Let us take a look at it. If we think it's a good case, we'll basically do the case, you know, for free. And I'll put an asterisk next to that because there's sort of different levels of contingency. There's, you know, complete contingency where the client, the client pays nothing. And so the law firm is footing the bill for all costs and all legal fees. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of only fees contingency. So then the client will pay for costs. Um, so that's sort of everyone I think is very familiar with what that is. Um, litigation funding is a third party comes in and pays a portion of the legal fees and the costs in exchange for an agreed upon return on the money that they've spent if the case is successful. So it works like contingency in the same thing because contingency fee, if the case is unsuccessful, the lawyers don't get don't get paid. Um, and that's the same thing with litigation funding. It's referred to as it's non-recourse litigation funding. Um, and so how it works generally is the, the litigation funder will pay usually um, all of the costs or like the maximum of what they will pay if the client wants it is all of the costs associated with the litigation. And they'll pay somewhere between 50 and 70% of the legal fees. And whatever that delta is between 100%, the law firm that's litigating the case has to take on contingency. And so, it, you know, it's a way of enabling it, it can, it, enabling plaintiffs to move forward with, with a broader selection of law firms because there's a lot of law firms that just don't do contingency fee work for whatever reason mm -hmm. um, and a lot of big law firms that don't do contingency fee work and so for a lot of plaintiffs if they if they have a meritorious case but for a reason can't afford to litigate the case you know they they all they have a subset of law firms that they can choose from if they have to do pure contingency fee it, litigation funding broadens that spectrum because there's a lot more big firms that are willing to do contingency or willing to do litigation funded cases, whereas they might not be willing to do a pure contingency fee. So, it, it, you know, it's something that patent lawyers sort of think started in the mid 2000s. And that's probably around the time that it did start in the patent world. But I think the reality is if you talk to, you know, like mass tort folks and, you know, class action attorneys and stuff like that, Litigation funding in this country has been happening since the 90s. Um, it just, I think, was not as well known. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's more prevalent, and it's been going on in Australia for forever, basically, like a very long time. Oh, it has. Um, so so I, I worked at a litigation funding company for, you know, roughly eight months um, trying to help them. As I said, LFG used to sort of focus on appellate funding. So you'd get a judgment, and they would do a deal to sort of give you some money up front, regardless of what happened on the appeal. But, you know, that market has changed dramatically for, you know, I think reasons we don't have enough time to get into. And so and they started wanting to do more, er, more early, early case funding, so pre-judgment funding. Okay. And they asked me to sort of come in and help them build out a portfolio of those types of cases across, you know, all types of litigation, not just IP litigation. And then certainly I helped them do... IP stuff too, because that's what my background was, but I was sort of helping them, you know, find cases and find invest potential investments across everything. It's an interesting sort of segment of the law that not a lot of people think about. Um, and were you assessing cases, providing like sort of an assessment of whether like this is a good case to invest in, you know, the, the, you know, there's a lot of math involved in this, right? So the, the percentage chance of return on investment and what that investment's going to be. And I mean, uh, like, there's a lot of math. And so yeah. I was doing, I was helping, you know, find case, you know, find potential cases 
Then when the case comes in the door, I was helping doing diligence on those cases to figure out whether they're good cases. And, and I, you know, there is a common misconception that litigation funding is a bad thing because it, it's basically proliferating unmeritorious, frivolous cases. The reality is that if you have any understanding of how the model works, which is if you lose, you don't get paid and you lose everything that you've invested, it quickly becomes apparent that that can't possibly be the funding model because if all you're doing is funding frivolous cases, you will lose all your money very quickly. And the reality is when you're when a litigation funding company is looking at cases, like let's say they look at 100 cases in a year, you know, it's many more than that, but let's just keep round numbers. The number of cases that they actually go into trying to negotiate a term sheet and do a deal on, it's less than 5% of what they look at. So it's less than five cases they look at and all the rest of those 95 get thrown out because it, either they're not a right fit for what the what the company invests for, more likely um, like the subjective merits of the case are bad and it's a loser. You know, that's the majority of why, why people get told no. So I think when you're looking at, if you're a defendant, and you find out that the plaintiff has has litigation funding, the reality is that case is probably a lot stronger than the vast majority of other cases that are out there because there have been yeah. a bunch of different people. So the law firm themselves has looked at it because remember, they're getting asked to take 50 to 30% of their fees on contingency fee. Right. And so they will have looked at it and say, are we comfortable taking that risk? The litigation funder will have looked at it and said, are we comfortable? Do we like the merits of this case? So that's two sets of eyes. And a lot of litigation funders now will get insurance on top of their on top of their deal. And so that's a whole nother set of eyes that come in and look because the insurance companies will come in and look and they'll independently assess what they think the merits of the case are. Mm -hmm. um, so if that case has gotten through all of that and gets filed, you know, the, you can be pretty sure that the merits of it are, are solid. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much uh, diligence being done by, you know, a lot of really intelligent people from a substantive legal standpoint, from a financial, you know, ROI standpoint, that by the time you get through the gauntlet of diligence required to sort of complete that process, it does, you know, build a lot of credibility around the substance of the, or the merits of the case. Um, yeah, and I think the, the other thing that's important to note that's sort of been a trend over the last couple of years is I think people think, oh, it's just, an listen, I started off by saying, you know, the best way to conceptualize what litigation funding is, is to come at it from what well, I know what contingency fee litigation is. So let's talk about how it's similar to that. I think most people, when they think of contingency fee litigants, plaintiffs, they think of people that, you know, don't have a lot of money. The shift, and, and you know, that's it's mostly true. Um, or, you know, they don't have enough money to litigate the cost of that case, which can be massive. Litigation funding now over the last couple of years has is now being seen by large companies that have enough money to litigate these cases. It's just another form of lever debt leverage. Mm -hmm. And so they look at it and say, well, listen, I could afford to pay for this litigation, but I can go get a litigation funder. And that's going to enable me to do the litigation funding at the same time I'm spending that dollar I would have spent on that on my core business function. Yep. And at the end of the day, when I add up the return that I made on the investment of my core business function with my return on the litigation, assuming I'm successful, even after I paid everybody out, the sum of that is is bigger than if I had only been able to invest in my core business function or only been able to invest that money in litigation. Because in, in the world before litigation funding, you can only spend the dollar on one of those things. Yep. And so the big change that you've seen over the last couple of years is massive companies that look at it. And you know a lot of times CFOs are getting involved and they're sort of saying, well, why are we paying for this? Go get a litigation funder. And then we can, we can spend money on our core function, business function, and we can also do this at the same time. Yep. Yeah, and we we went through at, at one of my stops along the way at, at a company called IGA, we went through something similar. We had a significant patent portfolio, two hundred plus patents, and we were trying to figure out how to, you know, um, you know, enforce that uh patent portfolio with massive companies and 
you know, I know, but, you know, I've talked to you about it. I mean, we, you know, we ended up selling to a, um, I don't know what you call them, you know, the, 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 the derogatory term people call them patent trolls, right? A non-practicing entity, Brian, please. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Non-practicing entity. And, but it was sort of that financial decision of like, do we want to spend a lot of money and a lot of time trying to, you know, prosecute this, this patent portfolio, or do we want to just get, uh, a return on that portfolio, a license back, and then deploy that cash into our, you know, research and development and other core business functions. And that was the path that we, we decided to go down. Um, and this wasn't even something that we'd even thought about. This was early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's right. And, and now it's basically someone that's in the place that you are in, which is essentially you have a massive patent portfolio. We want to try and figure out how we can monetize it. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, it kind of used to be, well, go and start an enforcement campaign or a letter writing campaign to try and get royalty licenses in place. But if you're going to do that, you're probably going to end up involved in a litigation or, you know, s reach out to a, a patent broker and sell sell the portfolio and get a license back. That was kind of the two different ways. And, yep. you know, now with litigation funding and there's some you know, pretty interesting insurance products out there too that you can employ that essentially give you, you know, a couple of other options to to try and monetize that patent portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really and, cool. I think it's fascinating. It's yeah, an interesting it, industry. And I think the thing that that I that I liked about it the most is it definitely changed how I view litigation. I think most attorneys, they don't necessarily, they don't view a litigation they're working on as essentially like an asset that they're trying to get ROI for their client on basically. Mm -hmm. And, and I very much look at a plaintiff side case in that manner these days, which is, okay, this is an asset. The client's trying to get a return on it. How can I get the best possible return in the shortest amount of time as possible. And that's kind of how businesses think about something like litigation. And I think this, that change of perspective has been incredibly helpful. Um, you know, and I listen, I think it applies to when you're defending a case too, which is, you know, this is a liability. How can I, it's a, sort of the flip. It's this liability. How can I, how can I decrease the risk of it as much as possible, as quickly as possible? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it's, and I think that that's been helpful. Yeah, the business side of law, I guess, you know, is is a topic we could talk about for, you know, a long time. But it it is interesting. Um, so with the little bit of time we have left, we're kind of running up uh, on the hour mark here. Talk about a little bit about um, what you're doing today and, and what your practice is like. And, you know, if you want to expand on any of the cases that you're working on today, if you can, um, kind of what's your practice like today? Yeah, so, you know, the transition... I ended up being at Law Finance Group for roughly eight months. And sort of what ended up, what happened was I was working at that company and I, I had a bunch of meetings with the managing partner at Miller Berendis to see if we could work out a uh, litigation funding deal with the law firm. Mm -hmm. um, and Jim and I had a handful of meetings and at the last, about that, and at the last meeting, um, he said, you know, we've been trying to find somebody to build a hard IP practice for us at our firm for you know about a year and we haven't really found anybody that we like and i really like you do you want to come do it mm. <laughs> that's flattering and, yeah i know it, it was and i and i thought you know i thought about it for a little bit and and met with uh, people at the firm and, and liked the people at the firm and sort of talked about some of the numbers and what they were envisioning and and, and sort of what the situation was going to be and it quickly became something couldn't really say no to. Um, and because listen, the number of times in the law firm world, the legal practice world where, where somebody comes to you with a very well-known and established platform like Miller Berendis is, I mean, you know, a lot of your listeners aren't in Los Angeles or California, but to the listeners that are, and the ones that practice in commercial litigation, like they all know who Miller Berendis is and they all know that they have an incredible reputation for, yep. for trial work. And so to be able to come into a platform like that and be told, we want you to build a, build a patent and, and sort of technical trade secrets and which are essentially, you know, 
trade secrets that you could go get a patent on if you wanted to probably, you know, it's for an actual device or a piece of technology or a source code, but for whatever reason you decided to keep it as a trade secret. Those are the types of things that I work on in addition to patents. You know, we want you to focus on building a practice group that does that and building a business that does that. And to have them, you know, put their money where their mouth is in terms of giving me, you know, I don't, I don't work on cases that I'll bring in. Um, and so to have the time to be able to, you know, do the business development that's required to build out a, a new, a, a new practice area, essentially, um, you have to have time to do that. And you have to have, a, you know, a rate that's conducive to doing that. And sort of, I've been given all the flexibility and the backing of Miller Baroness to be successful. And, you know, I think we're, you know, from, from my perspective, we're, we're doing, we're doing well. Um, you know, you can always be doing better, I think. Um, but, you know, I mean, listen, it's, it's public. I'm, I'm one of two national sort of, uh, lead counsel for Hyper Ice, the maker of the percussive massage guns and, and patent litigation that they have. Um, against distributors and manufacturers of what we think are infringing products. And, you know, we've got, you know, lawsuits all over the country right now mm -hmm. um, over that. And so that's, you know, that's a client that the firm had an existing relationship with. And, and you know, I sort of knew the person that was in-house from my former life that did patents. And, you know, we had a good meeting and ended up with something that, that happened. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's what I'm spending an awful lot of my time on right now. Um, is doing that. And, you know, I was watching, watching football last weekend. I can't remember what game it was on, but, you know, some, re some star player for one of the teams comes out of the field and I'm watching him he's, and he's getting worked done on the sideline. And I'm like, oh, those are two hyper ice massage guns that they're attacking his calf with. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you start working on stuff and then you start to see it kind of everywhere. Uh, yeah. It pops up. So, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so that's half the practice is, is, you know, traditional patent you know, traditional patent litigation, and I and I do a lot of work for um, former colleagues when in, you know, their firms have conflicts and they need somebody to come in and represent somebody in patent stuff. And then, you know, the other half of my work is doing uh, trade secret work on, on, on all kinds of trade secrets. My preference is to be doing technical trade secrets because it's, think, it's where I think I add the most value from my patent background and sort of understanding of technology. And it's something that I did an awful lot of that plaintiff side work at Kirkland and Ellison was pretty successful at trials with that over the last couple of years of my career. Yeah. Well, I, I love it. I appreciate you coming on the show. This is just the beginning of what I uh, suspect will be a very fruitful uh, career over many, many years to come. You have such a, an interesting, unique background that I think is very, you know, it's, it's differentiated from a lot of attorneys in the space. And uh, I I have uh, a sneaking suspicion that um, uh, you're going to be very successful over the next several decades, uh, especially with the the platform and you know firm like you know Miller Berendes that you're you're going to be able to sort of build that out and and uh, I'm excited for what's to come uh, for you and the firm. I think it's really exciting and so hopefully you'll come back on and and share some more war stories uh, with some of your clients over the coming years. Uh, it's an interesting practice. Uh, and, um, it's, it's a lot of fun and I, you know, we just kind of scratched the surface on a lot of things that I think we could talk about. So, um, very much appreciate you coming on the show. Well, listen, Brian, I, I'm knocking on wood, um, <laughs> in light of, in light of your projections, but I, I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it was great. All right. Thanks, Ben Herbert. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, for, uh, everybody listening, um, please, uh, tune in, subscribe on YouTube, uh, Spotify, Apple podcasts. Uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks to Array for sponsoring this and making it all possible. Ben, thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Have a good weekend. All right, you too.